from the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Believe me, great to see you all. Welcome to the World Over Live. What a show we've got for you tonight. We'll talk about a new inspirational film about to hit theaters starring a veteran actor. The film's called The Fifth Quarter. We'll talk to its star, the star of stage and screen, actor Aidan Quinn, about the film and the role his faith played in leading him to the project. And later, we'll discuss the recent U.S. intervention in Libya and presidential politics with former U.S. Senator Rick Santorum. If you'd like to be part of the show, give us a call. The number is 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally, 205 205- 271-2980, or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. Let's get things started. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. In Libya, after nearly a week of airstrikes to enforce the United Nations sanctioned no-fly zone, Operation Odyssey Dawn has become mired in politics. In the U.S., President Barack Obama is facing pressure from both sides of the aisle to explain U.S. involvement. In a letter to the White House, House Speaker John Boehner complained that the president ordered the military action without clearly describing the mission. He insisted that the president answer certain questions, including whether it was acceptable for Libyan strongman Muammar Gaddafi to remain in power. Meanwhile, it appears that NATO may soon take over the operation. Defense Secretary Robert Gates noted last weekend that the U.S. would be in charge for about a week and no longer. U.S., European, African, and Arab officials will meet in London on Monday to try to sort it all out. There are new concerns for Christians in Egypt after voters overwhelmingly approved changes in the nation's constitution this past weekend. Opponents fear that the swift timetable for parliamentary and presidential elections will aid groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood and members of the former ruling party. The Brotherhood had campaigned heavily for a yes vote in the referendum. Christians were encouraged to vote against it. The Christian minority was seeking to do away with Article 2 of its constitution, establishing Islam as the religion of the state and Islamic law as the main source of legislation. But to no avail, the package of nine new amendments passed with over 75% support. And more Christian persecution in the news this week in Pakistan on Monday. Two Christians were killed and two others seriously wounded when Muslims shot them outside a church in Hyderabad. The shootings took place after a confrontation between churchgoers and Muslims outside the building. Police have not made any arrests in connection with the shootings. Christians say authorities seemed inclined to ignore the incident. And in the Joss region of Nigeria, bomb attacks at two Protestant churches failed this week. One bomb exploded prematurely, killing three attackers. The other didn't explode. The five Iranian Christians will soon stand trial on charges of blasphemy. This, according to the Christian Solidarity Worldwide. The five, including a Protestant pastor, have already served eight months of jail time for crimes against the Islamic order. And the European Court of Human Rights has ruled that displaying a crucifix in a public school classroom is not a violation of human rights law. Surprise, surprise. Last week, 15 to 2's decision by the Strasbourg-based court overturns a previous decision by a lower panel. Vatican spokesman Father Federico Lombardi welcomed the decision, saying the court realized that the exhibition of the crucifix is not indoctrination, but the expression of a cultural and religious identity of countries of a Christian tradition. The decision applies to all member nations of the European Union. Back in the state, South Dakota's Republican Governor Dennis Dugard signed into law the nation's first 72-hour waiting period for women seeking abortions. The new law, which will take effect in July, also requires women to visit an abortion alternative center prior to obtaining an abortion. 
Planned Parenthood, the state's only abortion provider, has promised they will challenge the law in court. And in California, a federal appeals court on Wednesday refused to allow same-sex marriages to take place in the state while it considers the constitutionality of Proposition 8, the 2008 voter initiative protecting marriage. In January, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals asked the California Supreme Court to rule whether the drafters of Prop 8 had legal standing in the case. The state court indicated that it will not consider the question until at least September. Legal ex experts expect the case will eventually be decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. And Father John Corapi, the powerful preacher and familiar face to many EWTN viewers, has been suspended from public ministry by his superiors over allegations of misconduct. In a statement this past week, Father Karapi said a former employee has accused him of having drug addiction as well as, quote, multiple sexual exploits with her and several adult women. Father Karapi says all the charges are false. In light of the allegations, EWTN CEO Michael Warsaw said it is prudent for the network to suspend airings of Father Karapi's programs for the time being. In a subsequent statement, EWTN shared the disappointment of many viewers over the removal of Father Karapi's shows, but added that since all his priestly faculties have been removed, meaning he can't function as a priest in public, the network is obliged to remove his programs in obedience to the discipline of the church, end quote. And finally tonight, I've been getting lots of emails and calls from people worried about Mother Angelica. A random tweet released earlier this week indicated that she needed prayer and that, quote, death seems near. I spoke to Mother Angelica on Wednesday. She was eating ice cream at the time and doing just fine. Do keep Mother and the sisters in your prayers, but no, she's doing well. Her doctors are elated at how well she's doing, and her health is unchanged. Mother, if you're watching, hi and watch that ice cream. There is still time to pick up your copy of the Truth and Life Dramatized Audio Bible to use in your Lenten devotions. It's the only Vatican-endorsed, fully dramatized New Testament available anywhere. Five people won our contest last week, but you can sample a free chapter of the Bible by visiting RaymondArroyo.com. Blair Underwood, Neil McDonough, and more great actors bring the Gospels to life. If you'd like to purchase the entire audio Bible, click at the banner at the top of the site. And if you're planning a trip to D.C., why not experience the world over in person? Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, drop us an email, worldoverdc at yahoo.com, and we'll reserve a seat for you. When we return, stage and screen actor Aidan Quinn joins us to talk about his latest film project and how his faith inspired him to make it. When the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. Listen, I know you've been playing for Luke all year, but for this game, I want you to play for you. You've earned it. I want you to take the burden of this family off of your shoulders, and I want you to go out there, and I want you to have a ball. I want you to hit someone hard. I want you to play for the joy of playing the game. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. My first guest has been a fixture on stage and screen since the mid-80s. He starred in such films as The Mission, Avalon, Legends of the Fall, and Michael Collins. This fantastic actor's latest film is called The Fifth Quarter. It tells the story of a family moving through a tragic loss to find unity and hope. Please welcome via satellite from New York City, Aidan Quinn. Thanks for being here, Aidan. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I, I, I want to start with uh, you, a little bit of your background. I mean, so many of us have enjoyed your performances for all these years. Uh, I didn't realize you grew up both in Illinois as well as Ireland, and that that sort of shaped 
your uh, profession here, led you to your profession. What impact did it have, you bouncing from shore to shore here? Well, I think <clears throat> it was definitely probably the birth of an actor. You know, uh, especially as a youngster, you don't want to stand out. So whenever we moved uh, back and forth, you know, your, your voice uh, would you'd change your accent to try and fit in. And um, it certainly, you know, broadens the imagination. So, um, yeah, I think it definitely helped me uh, become an actor. Yeah, I, I read an article where whenever you return to Ireland, within a few days, you get that Irish brogue right back. Yes, yes, I, it has a tendency to happen. And, you know, there's so many different Irish accents uh, in different parts of the country, and we've lived in several of them. So uh, I, I seem to get uh, the accent back of the region that I'm in as well. Tell me about the fifth quarter, this new film that you're in. It opens this weekend. Um, it's a beautiful film, but, oh, my gosh, the beginning is wrenching. Tell us a little about this film and what first drew you to it. I'm told that it was your personal faith that played a role in your deciding to uh, go forward with this project. Well, it was really a testament to the incredible faith and strength of this family, the Abadi family and what they have been through and how they survived it uh, with uh, incredible oh, stamina and incredible generosity and how this horrific event of the the son is uh, in a high school football team and he accepts a ride home from uh, a kid who does uh, over 90 miles an hour reckless driving despite everyone in the car screaming at him to stop and it leads to a horrific accident and uh, Luke ends up dying and it's, uh, it tells the story of, of what happens to uh, this family and uh, how it ends up uh, you know Luke's uh, five of his organs go to uh, you know five organ recipients um, how Wake Forest uh, his brother John takes his number five and Wake Forest uh, goes on to have uh, with John Abadi being the star of the team a linebacker uh, going on to have the magical season, go 11-2, and two, win the ACC championship, go to the Orange Bowl. And um, it's interwoven with a lot, of, uh, a lot of pain and angst, but uh, a tremendous amount of good humor and, uh, and a real soulful, uh, you know, searching that this family has to do. Aiden, I want to share with our audience a little clip from the film The Fifth Quarter. Take a look. Sorry, sir. Listen, Luke Abadi, my boy, my boy, my son is in the accident. Sir, Do you know anything about him? I'm sorry, sir. Please wait is he? here. No, no, sure. listen. Somebody will be up sure. Listen to me. Listen to me. I need, I need to be with my son. No, sir. I need to be with my son. I'm not going to hurt anybody. My son is in the accident. Somebody will be here shortly. Just wait by the ambulance and I'll let you know. Please, I'm please. Not it's going to be okay. Just wait by the ambulance. Listen, do you have a child? That's my son! I just want to be with him! Somebody has to find something out! Where is he? No, oh, it's a terrifying opening, and that is uh, Aidan Quinn playing the father of Stephen Abadi in the in in the film The Fifth Quarter. Uh, did you meet with the parents, Aidan, and, and the man you portray in the film? Yes, I did. Um, they were with us all the time. In fact, uh, they're just outside the door here. <laughs> and uh, we you mean had, they're, they're uh, stalking you now, Aiden. Uh, no, no, no. They're they're helping. They're doing a, a better job at the publicity than I do. They're fantastic. And um, we got to spend time with them, and they were on the set, and uh, they were obviously gave us tremendous insight into the details of uh, of, of what happened and what particular scenes. Uh, and it was invaluable having them around. Yeah, it, it really honestly walks people through the, the levels of grief and how, you know, these, uh, how everyone starts to turn in on themselves and how this family, uh, largely because of their faith and the, and the strength of the family, uh, how they find this common purpose again and take this tragedy and turn it into something inspirational. Absolutely. You know, uh, certainly through, uh, you know, the... Oh, when something like that happens to you as a parent, I can, I, there's nothing worse. And um, certainly they bonded together through their love and through prayer and uh, their feeling of, uh, that Luke was, uh, Luke was around. 
Luke, Luke led that um, magical season with uh, his brother John uh, for Wake. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of coincidence around the number five. Uh, that was Luke's number. Um, Wake Forest would uh, intercept the, the ball with five minutes left. Uh, uh, John Abadi would have 15 unassisted ta uh, tackles. There was fives were everywhere. And even when we were filming, the, the, the num number five just kept reoccurring. Way too much to be coincidental. It was uh, a little spooky, actually. Huh. And that was his number. And, and throughout the film, they call the fourth quarter of the games the fifth quarter because everybody's holding yes, up the, they, the, the number five yeah, in the hand. Of, uh, they called it the fifth quarter uh, originally because... Um, Luke's uh, uh, pastor uh, decided that at the, at the high school game after he died that they were going to hold up uh, five for the at the end of the third quarter and call it Luke's quarter, the fourth quarter, and call it the fifth quarter. And John uh, took that idea with him to Wake Forest and started it with his parents, Stephen and Marianne, and started doing it privately. And it just spread. Uh, it spread around the whole stadium. And in the final p p game with Georgia Tech, even the opposing team and the opposing um, t team's uh, fans were doing it. So it, it was a very, very uh, emotional, uh, moving tribute to uh, Luca Body's life. Well, you, your performance in the film also is very affecting. I mean, uh, and the, the horrors that this family goes through, first discovering that this boy, you know, is dead, and then the wrenching decisions they have to make subsequently. Uh, you know, he's in the process of dying, and then they have to make decisions about him once he's in the hospital and, and uh, incapacitated. You, Aiden, also, when I was doing some of my research, you are also not untouched by difficulties, and uh, I know you had a daughter, or have a daughter, who um, has autism and contracted it uh, via a vaccination, right? How did that, that deepen your that appreciation and understanding of what this parent went through? Um, well, it, certainly, you know, that's a very difficult thing. And, um, you know, in the end, uh, it's a journey that you cannot continue to look at it as a difficult thing, but <laughs> even when it is because uh, it just, uh, it, it will debilitate you. My daughter is a blessed angel. And um, she, uh, more people um, are inspired around her from her smile and her laugh, um, despite her difficulties, you know, than, uh, than, uh, than anyone I can think of. So, you know, um, it is a difficult thing, but um, I don't know if I can quite compare it to the death of a son, I don't think there's anything uh, worse for a parent. I, I, it's, it's, it's hard to wrap your head around that. Absolutely. No, I, I, was, I was just struck as I read some of the interviews that you've done in the past where you said that the, the, this experience, you know, having your daughter contract autism and, and, uh, and the challenges that presents a, a family, that it actually, you thought, strengthened your marriage, which isn't a common outcome. This often drives couples apart. Well, that's true. I mean, I think uh, within the autism community, I think the divorce rate is 80% up from the n national median, which is 50%. So without a doubt, it has a tremendous strain. But I think in the couples that get through those first oh, really tough six, seven years, um, if they can get through that and uh, uh, realize that, that nobody else is going to understand what they've been through. No matter how good a friend or how loving a family member they are, uh, except for your wife, except for your husband, you know, um, and, um, and other parents that have been through it. So, so uh, I think uh, it's definitely strengthened uh, our bond. I mean, the, 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 you know, I, the, I can't imagine uh, ever being without my wife, and uh, I hope she feels the same way about me. I'm sure she does. Uh, I, I want to also talk about your mother, Teresa, who uh, I, I read would read you fairy tales. Did that, and, and she was very sort of determined about reading you fairy tales. Um, did, did, that, did that give you a sense of, and a love of storytelling? Was that the beginning of all of this for you? Yeah, well, the, definitely in the Irish culture, there's a tremendous uh, love of storytelling, a love of great characters, uh, 
love of wildness. Um, and um, yeah, that's certainly, I got that from both my mother and my father. And um, my father is a literature uh, a teacher, a teacher of English. So, you know, his profession was storytelling. And, um, but uh, definitely uh, my mother, um, she had a great, lively, uh, lively love of dance and uh, love of laughter. And, uh, you know, um, she's, uh, she died a, a year and a half ago, so she's, uh, she's sorely missed. But uh, I know she's around. I, I still talk to her all the time. Well, that's, you know, uh, what I love about this film, just bringing this full circle, and you just mentioned it, it, it does give you a very strong sense of that communion of saints that we always talk about. You know, that veil between uh, those who have gone before us and, and where we stand is actually very thin. And uh, in this film, you had a real palpable sense of that. And uh, th there's a moment, Aiden, I wish we had the clip. Uh, we may see it in the preview, uh, in the trailer coming up. There's a moment when you are... Um, you're pushing the, the casket down the aisle. And there, there was something, in, there's a gesture you, you made at the top of that when you, when you first went over to him and you sort of touched and, and caressed and kissed the, the casket. And that just seemed such a, it was just a perfect gesture for the love this father had for his son. And, and I think it's what so many of us feel when we're bidding loved ones goodbye. It's, it's, uh, they're there but they're, and they're leaving you, but you know, you're deprived of their presence and that's so hard. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, the one thing that, um, again, uh, I was told details about the actual scene by Stephen Abadi uh, himself that helped, the, you know, helped me get, do that scene. And, and wonderful actors that I got to work with, Andy McDowell and Ryan Merriman. Um, just wonderful, the whole cast, Amanda. But um, the thing that I hope for in this film, and I think closure is not a word that you can um, wrap one's head around when you've lost a child. But uh, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, it helps the Abadi family uh, move on uh, with knowing that Luke, and they do, and they, they know that uh, Luke is around, uh, and, uh, but that, uh, you know, that they can move on, and, and, and they are moving on in a, in, a, in a beautiful way, I think. Yeah. What do you, what, what do you want people to get from the film, uh, Aiden? as, as we, uh, my final question. Well, I think, uh, you know, the, the power, the, you know, life is just a, it's a whisper, it's a, it's a second, it's a breath of air, and that it's short, you know, um, in particularly Luke's life, but uh, knowing that, uh, you know, existence uh, does not stop with that, and nor does the bonds between the people that have gone before us, whether it's your son or your mother or, you know, a good friend, you know, I think you can still feel uh, the resonance of the connections to our loved ones. Mm -hmm. Aidan Quinn, thank you so much for being here. The film is the fifth quarter, magnificent performance uh, by Aiden and, and the entire cast. It opens Friday, March 25th at theaters everywhere. Be sure to go see it for more information. The fifth quarter movie.com is their website. Again, thank you, Aiden Quinn. Coming up, when we return, former U.S. Senator Rick Santorum joins me to talk about the fragile state of the Middle East and the upcoming presidential race in the U.S. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. I love you. Wait, 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 wait. I can't understand you. What? Do you have a child? That's my son! Oh, my God. Is he okay? He's just not coming back. None of us work without you, buddy. We'll love you forever, little brother. I want you to start practicing with the team. I don't know, coach. You need to go to therapy with her. I can't even take care of myself. And make them Honey, please, no more tonight. No, all right? You don't understand. How could you? I don't understand. I mean, if God is so good, then how could he let such bad things happen to good people? Everything you do should be for you and for Luke. All the way, all the way. You've got to start living for two, man. Three, two, one, now he's proud. I tried to claim his friend today. 
For the entire history of mankind, everyone is born, everyone dies. You think we'd know how to handle it by now, but we don't. I want to wear Luke's number five, coach. They're honoring John's brother, Luke, calling the fourth quarter the fifth quarter. Say it's going to be our advantage. Touchdown, Lake Forest! You know, before the season, press picked us to finish last in our division. Oh, my God! Today at Altel Stadium, the most unexpected conference championship game in the entire history of college football. You can't imagine what it means to me and my family to see everybody hold five fingers for it. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. With the tense situation in the Middle East and the recent intervention in Libya, as well as ongoing budget battles on Capitol Hill and a very special anniversary this week, we wanted to talk with a guest who could help us make sense of it all. With that in mind, we're joined and pleased to be joined by the former U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania and current senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center here in D.C., Senator Rick Santorum. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I want to start with Libya. We have gone into this to enforce this U.N. no-fly zone. First of all, do you support the U.N. no-fly zone? Uh, I think it's way too little too late, and it's not uh, a mission that is in the national security interest of our country. Um, if we were going to engage in Libya uh, and engage our military in Libya, uh, we need to engage because there's a, a significant effect on the security of our country. Um, if the... If the uh, the decision is just based around humanitarian aid or stopping some sort of uh, uh, crisis, then we'll be everywhere all over the world every week. Right. Well, the, U the U.N. The UN uh, uh, resolution said protect civilians. I mean, we should go into Rwanda, Uganda, Sudan, Cuba, China. Where do we stop? On and on and on. And that's the problem, that that, that is not what our military is for. Our military is to protect the security interests of this country. Mm -hmm. Now... I could make the argument, and in fact did make the argument, that early in this conflict, had the president been engaged and had some understanding of who these rebels were, what their potential was, what their willingness to be cooperative with the United States, mm -hmm. if we were going to be supportive of them, uh, and we had engaged them and felt comfortable that this was a group of people that we could work with, then as they moved toward Tripoli, and they were on their way to right. Tripoli, uh, then it might have been prudent for us to support them by recognizing them, maybe giving them some, uh, some military equipment that they could use, and even potentially uh, knocking out uh, Gaddafi's uh, air, air defense, I mean, uh, uh, air, uh, air covered air support. That's not what the president did. Uh, it, all he did was, as it looked like the rebels were going to take uh, Tripoli right. and the rest of the world, the French leading the way. That's not often said <laughs> yeah, that's right. uh, in recent times. Uh, the French leading the way, uh, the, the Arab League leading the way, uh, the president finally sort of went along and said, yeah, I want Gaddafi gone too. Yeah. The problem with that is when, you, when the president of the United States stands up and says, I'm for a head of state to be removed, you think that something would come along with that, like, like policies yeah. that would effectuate that result. Mm -hmm. And the president simply didn't do it. I, you know, it was during the time he was he was picking his bracket uh, for the NCAA, and so maybe this was just another pick well, along know, the way. Along the way, you know, I'll take Ohio State, I'll take Gaddafi. And, well, the problem <laughs> is that you know when the president of the United States says something, you have to back it up, or you don't say it. Mm. Well, but uh, let's back up here for a second. We're talking about going into this region, and he went into this region and committed our military for a limited amount of time. Now you've got people within and without of the administration, but in the American government, saying this isn't going to work. Gaddafi's going to going to survive this. Why go in and have these mixed messages coming from all sides? Well, again, the mixed message is we're, we want Gaddafi to leave. 
And the second thing that comes out of his mouth after the U.N. resolution is we're doing this for humanitarian purposes, and our objective is not to have Gaddafi leave. Uh, there is no policy here. There is just a president who... It, it, people have said he's indecisive. I, yes, he's indecisive. But this is as a result of a policy that this administration has practiced, which is the United States of America should not involve itself in the world affairs because all we do is mess it up. Yeah. Remember when he first got elected, he went around the world and said, you know, I apologize for America. Well, you know, we, we've done so much wrong in the world, particularly in the Middle East. Yeah. And so what you're seeing is a president who doesn't want to do anything wrong again. Well, here's my question. Who are these rebels? You, I mean, you follow the Middle East as well as anybody else. You talk to the... I mean, this is your specialty. Who are these rebels? You hear they're, they're all al-Qaeda-backed al operatives. Well, I mean, if you look at what's going on in Egypt right now, uh, you just discussed some, yeah. of, some of the things that are happening in Egypt, and, what, and that was the question in Egypt. Who are these rebels in Egypt that we were willing to throw in with? Mm -hmm. The president threw in with the rebels against Mubarak, who, again, tyrant, sure, authoritarian, sure, but friend of the United States. And we threw in with a group of people that we didn't know who they were. Mm -hmm. And now we're starting to learn that, well, they may not be the Jeffersonian types that we, <laughs> that we had hoped that they would hey, be. Yeah, I'll say. If you have a question uh, for Rick Santorum, 1-800. I know he's going to roll the prompter any second. 221-9460 <laughs> in the U.S. And internationally, 205-271-2980. Or drop us an email, world over at EWC.com. They expect you to know these numbers That's what Chris said. You should have memorized should this by numbers. now. Well, there's some things I just don't know yes. right off the top. Um, let's talk about what's happening for religious minorities, particularly Christians. Mm -hmm. Egypt, Iraq, Pakistan. You see this suppression of the Christian minority, and I've read in your writings, you say democracy is vital to protect these groups. How do you get democracies in these regi this region of the world, well, given the jihadist mentality that's taken over? This, is, this, is the, this has always been the big conundrum in the, quote, democracy movement. I, mm -hmm. I have been a supporter of the Bush doctrine, if you will, in this respect. That, the, that what we should be doing as a country is moving both friend and foe alike, who are authoritarian regimes, toward more political openness, toward more uh, economic freedom. But should we be ousting them militarily, which well, is what President Bush did? Again, he did that in Iraq, uh, yes. With a very mixed result, with, considering what's happening well, with the cradle of Christianity blown. Really. I, I, I agree with you that what we did not do and what we are not and continually not doing is... it. it using our influence in those countries to protect the minority, uh, uh, you know, the rights of minority Christians and Jews uh, and, and others. I mean, you have the Baha'i uh, in Iraq who are also in, and, and in Iran who are also being uh, persecuted. So, right. look, this, is, this is a, has to be a front and center issue for the United States. It was, uh, I can tell you, I work very closely with Dick Cheney, believe it or not, I know the Darth Vader, but mm -hmm. I work with Dick Cheney in working on the Afghan constitution, the Iraqi constitution, to make sure that religious liberties were protected. And we didn't win. Uh, we, and, and we, again, the government, our government went along with it. I think if, if we're going to have American military and might being used, then we have to use our might after the war as well as during the war. Mm. Why is, the, why is the Christian minority and these other fledgling uh, religious minorities important to the region? What do they provide to the social uh, cohesion there and the social makeup? Well, yeah, increasingly they are so small. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have been, uh, in, in not just in the last few years uh, under, in Iraq, but if you look at uh, what's going on in the Palestinian territories, what's going on in Syria, and you, what's going Turkey. on in Le Lebanon. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the Lebanese Christian community used to be pretty much on par, right. with, and that is no longer the case. The Christian community is being ejected from the Middle East, and one of the reasons I always talked about jihadism and that it's not just these radicals, but it is a growing element within the Arab world of, of this uh, ultra-Orthodox, if you will, or jihadist mentality of, of Islam, is you see it, by the expulsion of Christians, by the attacks on Christians, and the tacit, you know, acceptance of that by the population. They aren't doing it. The vast majority of the population, I'm sure, doesn't particularly like the idea, but they're not standing up against it. And when you mm -hmm. assent to something, it shows a deeper problem than what is just a very small percentage of the people who use violence. Uh, I want to shift gears. I want to talk about domestic matters for a little bit. You recently spoke out about JFK's famous statement, and he, I quote, where he said um, he believes in an America where the separation of church and state 
is absolute. It's absolute. Yeah. You said that's radical. That Why? is radical, and it's wrong because it's wrong. I mean, that's not what our founders believed. That's uh, the idea of, in the uh, in the Constitution was uh, the free exercise of religion, mm -hmm. and the idea was that uh, the, the government was to be influenced by faith. There was never and never a contemplation by any of our founders uh, who wrote those documents that people of faith weren't to be a vital part of, mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of, of, of arriving at the moral consensus that, that is part of governing this country. It was about keeping, it was about keeping government out of faith, the, not the faith out of the government. The famous letter that the, uh, that the folks on the left wave is this letter from Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist, which was a dead letter. Mm -hmm. It was something that had, was not talked about in the first 150 years of our government. But it, and it was written 12 years after the, uh, the Constitution was passed. So mm -hmm. it was not, and by the way, Jefferson wasn't even in the country when the yeah. Constitution was. So Jefferson was a lot, very important in the Declaration of It, but was not that significant a figure in the Constitution. And so Jefferson, when he was elected president, was written a letter by the Danbury Baptist mm -hmm. who, uh, who were concerned about the state impacting their religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and and he, he, they wanted assurances from Jefferson that the government would not tell them how to practice their faith. And that's when he came up with this wall of separation. What Kennedy did was take the wall of separation that government shouldn't impact religion and said, no, religion shouldn't impact mm -hmm. government. Jefferson would be spinning in his grave with that. Senator Santorum, how do you balance that, though? If you are, you, you, you were in public service, you were a senator for how many terms? Two terms? Yes. Um, how do you balance that? Having your faith being known as a Catholic, as you are, and wanting to serve all the people who may or may not share your faith? Well, first off, let me, let me say, answer it generally, then specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, James Madison uh, you know, talked about uh, how the, uh, this freedom of religion was the true remedy mm -hmm. of how a government can be put together where people can learn to get along. Why? Because the idea was everybody, faith, no faith, whatever faith, mm -hmm. everybody's allowed in. Everybody can make their faith claims in the public square. They can make their reason claims in the public square. Mm -hmm. They can make a combination of faith and reason. Whatever it is, everybody's allowed in. You work it out. You, you go through the process. And when you win or lose, you've at least walked away thinking, I had my shot. And that's why Americans can get along and, and do get along, because we feel like, you know, we've had a fair chance. And the same thing when it comes to serving in public life. I come forward and say, you know, I, I believe as a Catholic, and using, quoting the Pope's encyclical, fides et ratio. It's not mm -hmm. just faith that you're mm -hmm. bringing into the public square. You're bringing reason into the public square. And as you know, if, if something is true, you can get there either way. If your faith is true and your reason is right, you will get to the same conclusion. And so when I bring my, quote, faith in the public square, I do so on the other wing also of reason because there are people, as you mentioned, who do not share my faith. And they have a, uh, an oblig I have an obligation to make the case to them that this is the right reasoned way of approaching this problem. Okay, given what you've just said, you recently were quoted as saying Sharia law is incompatible with American jurisprudence. Yeah. This was just at the top of March. Yet these Muslims fervently believe, and not a few of them, a good number of them, that Sharia law is their code and they should be allowed to exercise that religious freedom here in the United States of America. You say what? Uh, I'll say a couple of things. First off, they are allowed in the public square mm -hmm. and they are allowed to make their argument that the Sharia law should be the law of this country. Uh, and I'm allowed to go out and say it is incompatible with the law of this country. Why is and, it incompatible? Well, uh, because it, 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 the basis of it is not based on, uh, on, on the dignity of every human person and that, mm -hmm. and, and that the, the constitutional, I mean, the declaration of understanding that all men are created equal uh, and that uh, there is free will. And all, all, there's, there's certainly a lot of, I mean, I can go on through sort of yeah. underpinnings and then specifics about the treatment of people in, uh, under Sharia law that is incompatible with American jurisprudence. But the underpinnings are, are not the same underpinnings as we have here in Western civilization. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I say they're incompatible. But again, they have a right to, to make that argument. They also have the right uh, to, to live their lives in the privacy of their own home uh, that where Sharia is not inconsistent with American civil law they have a right to practice their faith. 
-hmm. when that faith is inconsistent with American civil law, for example, uh, you know, the, uh, the treatment of women in, in Islam, uh, honor killings, for example, mm -hmm. well, that may be compatible with Sharia law. It is not compatible with the American civil law, and the American civil law trumps that uh, practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to move on. This is a big week, a huge week, a year anniversary uh, happy of birthday. the health care bill. Now, did they have a party at the Centaurum home is my first uh, question. You know what? I didn't see did a you party. A little... did you, I didn't see a real big celebration in the Obama administration. <laughs> I mean, you know. Well, they sent Marcellus, that little child out that they were pushing. <laughs> yeah. he, he, he appeared on some of the shows. It, but, but it was a kind of quiet celebration. It was. Uh, celebration. For, for something as... Momentous. Truly momentous and history making as as the uh, as Obamacare was, uh, they 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 realize that this is not a very popular program, and they go out and they, the funny thing is that they go out and promote you know these two or three little things in this thousand plus page bill you know one or two little things like well you know you can uh, your your kids when they graduate from college can stay on your health insurance. No oh, great. Well, most states in the country already <laughs> did that, and every state in the country, if it's a good idea, can do that. I don't want them on my you health care insurance well, that's, after they graduate. They bye said bye. They, they said they can. Yeah, they, they you got your to. four years. Right, go. Right. Yeah. But the whole point is, the things that they advocate are really things that have nothing to do with Obamacare. They're just, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're sort of appendages that were popular that are used to sell Obama. That, what Obama, at the heart of Obamacare, is the government dictating the, the private market system in healthcare. I have some questions I want to get to, but before I do that, I'll use this to pivot to uh, our final little topic here. Uh, given your opposition to healthcare and the My opposition wide. to Obamacare. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, that's okay. what I mean. This, right. this healthcare reform, yeah. I should have been more specific. Does this destroy the candidacy of Mitt Romney, given his experiment in Massachusetts? Well, uh, Mitt Romney's defense of that experiment was he, that, unlike the federal government, which he, and I agree with him, doesn't have the right to force you to buy insurance, the individual mandate, that the state of Massachusetts can do that. And I would agree with him. The state of Massachusetts, there's nothing constitutionally uh, prohibited by the state of Massachusetts to do it. The question is not whether they had the right to do it. It's whether it was the right thing to do. And it was not the right thing to do. Uh, requiring everybody to buy insurance that the government tells you you have to buy, uh, and how you buy it, where well, you could find if you don't, uh, who's going to cover you, how much they're going to charge, all of these things is a top-down way of running the system. The beauty of America from its very beginning was that America is about giving people freedom and allowing each and every one of us to pursue God's call on our life. And in doing so, we create a greater whole individually and as a family and community, all of this and that, that freedom and that responsibility that comes with that, that from the bottom up, we create a great society. That's not what Obamacare or Romneycare is about. It's about top down mm -hmm. how we do things, and it's wrong. Okay. I, I've waded you into the presidential political pool, and I have to keep you here for a moment. Okay. Next week, I've, I've I'm testing up, the water, so I've that makes sense. I've looked up your itinerary. You are in Iowa and New Hampshire. Your 25th visit to the states. Are you running? Uh, I'm still am, I'm, you know, in the sort of the testing the waters phase. How long can you stay in the testing the water phase? Well, you got Valenti in. You've got Newt a, a foot in the water. Michelle Bachman's assembling a team in Iowa and New Hampshire and North Car uh, uh, South Carolina. Yeah, well, we've we've been assembling teams too. I mean, I'm I'm going through that process, and and that's part of trying to determine whether, you, in fact, you have the, uh, the necessary support to make this happen. And, and that's sort of step one. And step two is, do you have the necessary resources to make it happen? And, and we're sort of going through that phase of the testing the waters right now. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll be you know, a little bit more public about how we're going to do that in the future. But that's sort of the, the phase. And then, as you know, Raymond, you know, we've, Karen and I have seven children. And yeah. uh, we're going through that process internally. As Do you to, want to subject everybody to this? Well, look, the only reason Karen and I have talked about this and, you know, uh, she is not champing at the bit to do this, let me assure you. And, and the kids, they understand the sacrifice that's involved in this. And, um, and I, I wouldn't be doing it either if, unless I felt this was what's, what God was calling us to do. And um, I can't imagine taking on this responsibility, going uh, and, and, and trying to offer yourself to be the president of the United States if you didn't feel like that was your call. Mm -hmm. And... And that's what we're trying to discern right now. Okay. Now I want to go to a caller. Here's John from Hawaii. Go ahead, John. What's your question? Aloha. Um, aloha. Aloha. Aloha, aloha, aloha. I was calling to find out uh, what uh, this gentleman's response is to 
former President Ronald Reagan, God bless his soul, in heaven, did he have any congressional approval when he ordered the uh, bombing of Libya? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as, you, as you recall, that was a, uh, a retaliatory strike of a, uh, an attack on the United States. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's very clear uh, that the president has the authority uh, to, to strike uh, in a timely fashion and not have to go through uh, getting congressional authority for a limited strike. Had mm -hmm. President Reagan decided to mm -hmm. conduct a war to uh, remove li uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the regime in, in Libya, mm -hmm. then I think he would have had to go to the, to, uh, to, the, to the Congress, but not to respond and retaliate to an attack on our country. Mm. We're, we're getting a lot of questions here, and I, I have to ask this. We, we discussed this earlier because they, they started coming in earlier. And it's people basically saying, uh, here's one from Michigan. Can you please ask Mr. Santorum why he supported Arlen Specter, who was the pro-choice candidate running in Pennsylvania, in your home state, not so long ago. Specter went on to win election and was later unceremoniously kicked out of office uh, when he flip-flopped and, and joined the Democratic Well, had I known he was going to be the deciding vote on Obamacare, I wouldn't have done it. But, you know, <laughs> if, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. What I did know is that he was going to be the chairman of the Judiciary Committee at a time when we had a 51-49 majority and we were going to have two to three Supreme Court justices coming up. And uh, to me, uh, the Supreme Court is the long-term battle uh, and, and Senate seats and House seats are the short-term battle. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Senator Specter, as chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, said to me that he would support the president's nominees, uh, and obviously not carte blanche, they would have to work no. with him on it, which they did, and, uh, and he did. He supported uh, both Alito and Roberts, and mm -hmm. I think it goes, I mean, just as Casey Sengel you could say, said, you can look it up, mm -hmm. uh, Justice Alito would not be on the court today if it wasn't for Arlen Specter, uh, heroic, really, defense of him throughout this process. So, to me, that was the most important issue, which was to have someone like Specter, who, if he supported a conservative justice, that justice would pass. And that's exactly what happened, and that's why I did what I did. Mm. Uh, let's talk this, this week. Uh, Senator from Massachusetts, Scott Brown, came out in support of Planned Parenthood and said they should not be defunded in the federal budget. First question, should he face a serious pro-life primary challenge? Well, uh, that's up, I always say that's up for the people of Massachusetts and that state. I'm not, I don't go out recruiting candidates for or against mm -hmm. anybody, but uh, obviously he should be held account to that. And I think it's important for the people of Massachusetts who feel the way, the way we do to let him hear that. I think what happens to a lot of folks who are from states like Massachusetts and Rhode Island that are, by the way, very heavily Catholic states, yep. but very liberal states, is they just assume that uh, all these liberals support that position. And, you know, he's trying to win re-election up there, and he's trying to, you know, balance his votes. And he's probably not hearing uh, in, in uh, loud measure from the, from the uh, people in, in Massachusetts. So I would make sure that he does hear that and, and understand that that's not a freebie for him and that maybe the next time he'll be more cautious in how he makes these proclamations. Uh, here's a question about Israel is being pushed against the wall. They're surrounded by al-Qaeda. If and when they decide to fire back, what do you suggest uh, the president is going to do? Well, I can tell you the president's popularity ratings in Egypt, uh, excuse me, in Israel are in the single digits. Uh, they, they believe that he has betrayed them. Uh, he betrayed them in Egypt. He has betrayed them with, with respect to Iran when he had an opportunity to try to help depose that regime, which is an existential threat to the state of Israel. Uh, he has taken and sided with the Palestinians on repeated occasion. I mean, here you have this, this horrific murder of, uh, of, of this family uh, in, the, in the West Bank where people came in in the middle of the night and slit the throats of these children and killed the parents. And the Obama administration was like, well, we, you know, we're, we're against violence. We're, Israel builds a condominium, and the president of the United States flips out, says, oh, this is a betrayal, this is horrible, this is... But there's a lot of violence on both sides of that wall. Right? Yeah. I mean, you, got the, you got the Israeli military, too, moving in. You know, ex I mean, you know, these ex people, it's not like everybody, they have tanks facing them either. I mean, it's, I understand the, the, the security of Israel, which they're entitled to. The question is, though, in those contested areas, should they be placing settlements there or not? Uh, my feeling is that is the state of Israel, and they have a right to put their settlements where they're... I mean, mm -hmm. look, look at the boundaries of the United States. How did we get our boundaries? In part by war. Mm -hmm. Now... Because we got them by war, should we now say, well, 
We got them by war. We have to give them back because that was an ill-gotten gain. Israel was attacked. They counterattacked, mm -hmm. took territory. It's their territory. Now, if they want to give it back, that's their business. Yeah. But to suggest that somehow because it's their territory that was gotten by war that it's illegitimate, well, we're going to go around a lot of places around the world and we're going to have territories swinging back all over the place. That's how things have occurred throughout history. And mm -hmm. I don't know how, and if you look, again, go, go back in history and you will find that these kinds of conflicts usually are only settled by a conflict where one side wins, the other side loses, and you dictate terms. That's how things get settled. And unfortunately, we may be, uh, you know, at, at some point approaching that again here in Israel. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of emails about the health care bill and people asking, given the, the way this deal is set up between the House, you've got Republicans in the House, democratically controlled Senate, and a Democrat sitting in the White House, is there any chance of repealing or pulling back the funding for portions of the health care bill? Well, the repeal of Obamacare will only take place uh, after this next election. And, mm -hmm. and I think it has to be the central, for me, it's the, it's the central issue that I talk about. Because it's not only, <coughs> excuse me, about sure. the um, uh, huge amount of government and taxes and spending. Uh, it really will, in my opinion, shift the balance irreversibly uh, to, to where we are a country that will have fundamentally lost our freedoms. Once the government can say to you say that your daughter doesn't need health care mm -hmm. unless you pay more taxes, unless you give us more authority, yeah. uh, then the, 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 the era of big government is, um, you know, will be set in stone forever. And so repealing Obamacare to me is, 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 a, is, is a fundamental thing. So uh, where does the, what can the House do? They can try to defund the implementation. The only way they're going to do that is if they're willing to say, as Steve King and Michelle Bachman have, have tried to do, We've passed H.R. 1. H.R. 1 defunds Obamacare, and we're not moving. And if you don't, if you don't, if you don't do that, then, uh, you know, I guess we'll have a government slowdown, not a shutdown. I mean, uh, I think the president is historically about 80 percent of the federal government is considered essential personnel, and they get funded. Mm -hmm. Social Security checks go out. Right. Uh, the military gets paid. So there'll be a small portion of the government that won't work. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's worth standing tall and saying, mm -hmm. Wait, the way you funded Obamacare was wrong, and we need to defund it. I've got to run very quickly. When will you announce your intention to run for the presidency uh, in the of the next, United States? In the States? next few months. Next few months. Yeah, Thanks sometimes. for being so specific. Yeah, you got Senator it. Rick Santorum, if you'd like to read uh, the senator's columns, you can go to the Gathering Storm and find more information about the project to promote and protect America's freedom by visiting Ethics and Public Policy Center website at eppc.org. Thanks so much for being with us. Until next week, you can find updates and the occasional commentary by following me on Twitter or on my fa Facebook fan page. Too many apps. Just go to RaymondArroyo.com. You can click through there. You can also sign up for my e-blast and get your full, free, fully dramatized Gospel of Mark from the Truth and Life audio Bible at RaymondArroyo.com. Until next week, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Thank you.